Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see those of you in house with us tonight. Also good to have those of you joining us online. We pray that the Lord blesses our time together in a wonderful way. Do want to announce that this uh, upcoming Sunday, December the 3rd, we are having our Christmas tree service. So make sure you come out this Sunday morning. Come on out for Sunday school at 10 and then worship service at 11 o'clock. And uh, that's always a special service. On the 17th, December the 17th, we're having our Christmas cantata on that morning. And then in the evening at 5.30, we're having our youth and children's Christmas play. So uh, come on out and support the young people there also. Of course, we'll be here on Christmas Eve for Sunday school and morning worship at 11 o'clock. So uh, make plans to worship on Christmas Eve uh, before or after you get together with all your families. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful for this day and we are thankful for this time of year where we celebrate your birth. And Lord, truly, each Lord's Day we celebrate your, your birth, your life, your death, your resurrection because in that gospel, the good news, we find our salvation and hope. We thank you for coming. We thank you for coming in the flesh and paying the penalty for our sin. Draw us more closely to the, this Christmas season, Heavenly Father, and may your Holy Spirit, Lord, lead us into beautiful times of worship and refreshing of our soul. We pray, Lord, that this season lost people will come to know you as Savior, that the straying child of God might be brought home, and Heavenly Father, that you will encourage the saint who is struggling. Lord, do that even tonight as we worship in song and look into your word and pray for one another. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'd like to, turn in your hymn book to hymn number 220. Otherwise, let's stand together and let's sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus, hymn 220. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sing as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. Despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever. 
river I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love, pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. It's still the greatest story ever told. Amen. You may be seated. Well, tonight, uh, for Wednesday night, kind of a Christmas Bible study, uh, this Christmas study is, is designed to bring a sense of wonder back to our Christmas story experience. Uh, sometimes the sense of wonder can be found again when we allow ourselves to wonder. And have you ever wondered about Zachariah and Elizabeth? Well, I know the, the group that is here tonight, you would join me in saying, yes, uh, we have read of the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and we have wondered about their life and all that God did in their life. Uh, we tend to jump ahead straight to the manger when it comes to Christmas, but when we do, we can be missing a, a great lesson experience by two faithful believers in Zechariah and Elizabeth who are a part of the Christmas story. And so tonight, Let's be encouraged and be reminded of what happens in the wait. You know, I was thinking this week, waiting can be one of the most difficult tasks that we have to endure, isn't it? Uh, I, I miss Mama's cooking, and especially through the holidays. I miss Mama's cooking. And I was thinking back this week of sometimes waiting for Mama to get supper ready was difficult at times, smelling it, and still it wasn't ready especially after church on Sunday morning, waiting for her to come back from church. And she might have prepared some of it before and then went to church and come back to finish things up. And I was hungry and waiting for that uh, Sunday dinner, that Sunday lunch to get done. But it was always worth it, wasn't it? It was always worth it to, for Mama's cooking. And also, I thought of being a child at Christmas time could be difficult as well. We see that in the lives of our children and grandchildren still especially waiting for Christmas morning to open the gifts. Some of that had been under the tree for days and some weeks, and that was challenging. But again, it was worth it. Uh, it was worth the wait, especially as Mom and Dad always worked hard to make Christmas special for Sherry and I. But waiting can be difficult. Uh, but when you are waiting on the right thing to unfold or to happen by the hand of God, it's always worth waiting on. It's always worth waiting on God to move in our lives and our hearts. From Father Abraham to today's Christian, you and I in the pew today, God's people are a people that must wait upon the Lord. And we must wait for all of his promises to come into fulfillment. But waiting on God to move is always worth it, even though it's not easy at times. Psalm chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, the psalmist proclaimed, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Micah 7, 7 says, As for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation my God will hear me. What a wonderful confession of faith. Waiting in faith is part of the Christian experience. Waiting on God to move. Waiting is hard, but it is worth it. Well, in the Gospel of Luke, we find the story of Christmas, again, didn't begin at the manger, but several important things happened before that special night at the manger in Bethlehem. The Hebrew people had been waiting for uh, the promised Savior now for hundreds of years. And it had been about 400 years uh, since the last prophet had spoken for God. And God's people were waiting to hear from God and see him move again in their lives. 
And Luke begins his telling of the Christmas story with the good news that a new prophet would come to make the way, to prepare the way for this long-awaited Savior. This prophet would prepare the way of the Messiah. The prophet was one that we know called John the Baptist. And he would be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He would prepare the path for Jesus Christ with the message of repentance because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And so the Bible makes us privy to the story of John's birth and ministry. And so let's look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Now what two people are mentioned as the main characters in these verses? Well, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And what do we know about them? Well, the Bible tells us they were both descendants of priestly lines, for one thing. Also that they both lived righteous lives before the Lord. It says they observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. They were godly people. They were God-fearing people. They were God-serving people. They were people, too, waiting upon the promise. Now, it also says that they were childless and that they were now older and they were past the age of bringing a child into the world naturally. However, God had heard their prayers and he would bless them with a child. And not just any child, we know that child again was the forerunner of Jesus that also had been prophesied about centuries before. Let's go on and read Luke chapter 1 now beginning in verse 8. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. Well, we all know that one of the longest waits is the nine months before a baby is born. Uh, there is nothing to be done to hurry it along. As a matter of fact, we want it to go its term. But in that time of waiting, there's much taking place. There's much preparation. And so we also see that waiting does not mean that one is idle. And I think that's a great misconception. Waiting is not worthless time spent. It can be if we don't use it wisely. But waiting does not mean idle. Zechariah and Elizabeth were not idle in their service to the Lord. They were not idle in their prayers. They were not idle in their faith. And much is to be accomplished in the wait, but the outcome is worth it when you hold that child in your arms. Well, it is the same with any answered prayer. Waiting is worth it when that promise comes into fruition, when God answers that prayer. Webster's definition of waiting includes to stay or rest in expectation. And so we wait with expectation. It says also to stop or remain stationary until the arrival of some person or event to be ready to serve, to obey. And so waiting is not to be wasteful time. It is not a time of waste, but it is a time of preparation. And both of these would be applicable descriptions of Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
They were waiting, and they had been waiting for decades, not only for a child for themselves, but also for the Savior to come. They had been waiting for a baby, and as faithful Jews, they had waited in expectation for the arrival of a promised Savior. And during all that time, they'd been faithful to serve and obey God. And so they weren't being idle in the wait, and God was not idle either. He was at work all the while to bring about the forerunner and the Savior of mankind that we are reminded of, especially this time of year. Zechariah and Elizabeth had waited years to become parents, and it must have seemed like such a long, long wait, much longer than the nine months they waited for him to be born. And so, yes, we do wait as Christians, and it is good that we wait as Christians because we want to wait on God to move and not to try to fix things ourselves, which can cause us a lot of problems sometimes. But the wait is worth it. The wait upon God is always worth it. Secondly, we also must be reminded that God is at work in the wait. God is at work in the wait. The length of time that Zechariah and Elizabeth had waited was no surprise to God, was it? He knew. And he had already been at work for many years, preparing things for this special and unique time in history. And we can believe that even in our times of waiting, God is at work. God is at work in your life tonight and through your prayers. God is at work in the life of this church. God is at work in the life of this community. Even when it doesn't seem like it. Even when it seems like things are dead and God's voice is silent. Not only is the wait worth it for the child of God and for the church, but we must also believe by faith that God is at work in the wait. Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. But when the fullness of time had come, the scripture says. And so God was not late in sending the Messiah, nor was he early. But God is always right on time. His time. Just as he is always on time, in our lives as well. In that last book of the Old Testament, the one God had moved the prophet Malachi to write about 400 years before the birth of Zechariah and Elizabeth's son. It says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 in the NIV, it says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you desire, will come, says the Lord Almighty. And so there in Malachi, uh, we see prophesied John and Jesus both. So even about 400 years before that, the prophet Isaiah wrote about their son too. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling... In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And so now some 800 years, even before John the Baptist would come in the flesh through the lives of Zechariah and Elizabeth, God was working. And so God is always at work, even during the time of waiting. And so we see that even though Zechariah and Elizabeth had waited decades for a child, God had been preparing for their child, John the Baptist, many hundreds of years, even before Zechariah and Elizabeth had themselves even been born. Now let's go to Luke chapter 1, and verses 57 through 66. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. 
And they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. And they said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. And he asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately, his, being Zachariah's, mouth was opened and his tongue set free. And he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Well, the complete story of John the Baptist is really a whole uh, other lesson. But God had a plan, and God had prepared the way for John the Baptist to be born. And he had prepared the way for John to be greatly used by God to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so even in the wait, much was taking place that could not be seen by man until God brought it all in true fruition. You know, it's the same with us. We cannot always see God working. But we must by faith believe that he most certainly is always working. All things together for the good of his children and all things together for the good and the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. So in times of waiting in our lives, we can trust God's plan. Amen. We can trust that he is at work. Nothing takes God by surprise. He hears our prayers. He knows our prayers. And even while we must wait at times for things to happen, God is at work in the wait. A great deal took place that first Christmas, even before Jesus was born. In the wait, there was great expectation and probably also fear of the unknown for those who lived it. This can be one of the most difficult things not to be overtaken by fear and anxiety while we wait upon God to move in our lives. And yet, this is the testing of our faith. This is the growing of our faith. This is the strengthening of our faith. The waiting is where our faith grows, where it learns to anchor deep in the promises of God. It's in the wait where we learn to fellowship with God and we learn to lean upon God and not upon our own understanding. And when the wait is over is when our faith is rewarded and much joy takes place in our lives. This Christmas, may we keep our eyes and our hearts open with great expectation. For all that God has ahead of us, leading us even to the second coming of Jesus Christ as we celebrate his first coming. Yes, the world seems scary at times, but we must believe the faith that God is in control and that he can be trusted with every circumstance in our life, whether it seem large and monumental or small and insignificant. God is in control. The disciples were anxious uh, for the kingdom of God to come when they were following Jesus Christ. And they were waiting for the kingdom to come and to be established. They wanted it to happen right then. But it was not time, even though Jesus had come. And still, the truth is, we are waiting for the kingdom to come in its fullness even today. It has come in Jesus Christ but it is still to come in its fullness. In that time, Jesus encouraged his anxious apostles before he would go to the cross for what would at first seem to be a defeat for the disciples, as that was a miserable and fearful time for them. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, Jesus comforted the lives of his disciples. 
Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philippians 1.6 says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Yes, we are still waiting for the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We are waiting as we have prayed many prayers in our lives, some to come into fruition, for God to move in our prayers. But we can trust in him that even in the wait, he is working. Even in the quiet, he is moving in our hearts and in the hearts of others around us. And we can be assured that the good work of salvation that he has started in our lives, he will bring into completion. The truth is this, uh, for some people, today may feel like a wasteland to them. Uh, it may feel like a parenthesis between a long past and a longed for future. But today, even today, the God of waiting has good works for you to walk in. And so let us wait with expectation. Let us wait in faith. Let us wait as Zechariah and Elizabeth did. Not worthless and being wasteful in times of waiting, but to be active and to serve the Lord as we wait with expectation. Do your work. Serve your family and your friends. Love your neighbors. Share the gospel. And trust that one day soon, you will join all of the saints of the past to sing one unified song of God's provision and providential hand when the kingdom comes. Psalm 25, 3 says, None who wait for you shall be put to shame. Isn't that beautiful? None who wait for you shall be put to shame. Again, Waiting on God is not worthless time spent when we are waiting on God with expectation and obedience. And this is how we must wait. Your faith will be rewarded, child of God. And remember, God is always at work, even when he seems to be quiet. And so hold fast to God and get to know him and trust him even more in the season you're in while you wait upon his promises to come into fruition. To God be the glory and all of his children said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, help us to wait, but help us to wait with faith and expectation and hope. Help us to learn to trust you while we wait, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh God, to lean upon you and not upon our own understanding. Forgive us, Lord, when we are sometimes like Abraham and Sarah and come up with our own plans uh, to bring about our prayers into fruition. We mess things up. Forgive us of that. Lord, reward these people who are trusting you with many circumstances in their life that are troubling them now. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Hear and answer their prayers according to thy will and for their good. Minister unto each soul, Holy Spirit, as only you can. And give to us, not only tonight, but this Christmas season, the peace of heaven that comes through knowing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. We have many upon our hearts tonight, Lord, that we are concerned about. Many that are troubled. Many that are sick. 
many that are waiting, some that have lost loved ones. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will pour over them the oil of gladness and that your presence would be made manifest where they are at. Help us as a church, Lord, as people of God, to also take time to minister unto them. Lord, thank you for this time you've given us tonight. Thank you that you are a God that is always at work, even when we don't see it. In Jesus' name we ask these things, and for his sake, amen. Well, for those of you joining us online, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Again, if at all possible, come be with us this Sunday morning. Sunday school at 10. We have a class for everyone. And then our morning worship service is at 11 o'clock, where we'll be celebrating the decorating of the Chrismon tree here at Westside Baptist Church and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, throughout the month of December, we will not have Sunday evening services except on December the 17th as that will be our children's and youth Christmas play. So come on out, and that will be at 5.30. Uh, that morning on, Jan or on December the 17th, we'll also have our adult cantata. So come out and worship with us those days. And uh, again, please make plans to come out on Christmas Eve, Sunday school at 10, worship at 11 o'clock as we read the Christmas story, sing beautiful Christmas hymns together, and worship the Lord who has come. His name is Jesus. Uh, there's still power in that name. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Goodbye.